Good afternoon and welcome. I am Michael Kessler, Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown, a faculty member in the Government Department and the Law Center. On behalf of President DeJoya and Vice President for Global Engagement, Tom Banchoff, I am delighted to welcome you here this afternoon for this year's Berkeley Center Lecture by Professor Martha Nussbaum, Ernst Freund, Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago. Her talk today is entitled Anger and Revolutionary Justice, a most important philosophical examination of anger as a response to grave injustice. This year's lecture is part of a semester-long conversation on development convened by the Georgetown University Global Futures Initiative, a new university-wide effort led by Vice President Tom Banchoff to advance research, teaching, and outreach around pressing global issues. Professor Nussbaum's rigorous and precise philosophical work and the sheer breadth of her intellectual focus are nearly unparalleled. Her appointments at the University of Chicago display the range of her work. As professor of law and ethics, she is appointed in the law school and the philosophy department. She is an associate in the classics department, the divinity school, and the political science department. She is a member of the Committee on S Southern Asian Studies and a board member of the Human Rights Program. I can say from personal experience, she is an astoundingly gifted and challenging teacher and an inspiring, supportive mentor to her many, many students. She has influenced an entire generation of scholars across a range of disciplines. Her publications are simply too long to list here. She asked me to keep this very short, so I will endeavor. Um, some of the highlights of the publications, some of which you, I'm sure, will have read, The Fragility of Goodness, Luck and Ethics in Greek Tragedy and Philosophy, Love's Knowledge, The Therapy of Desire, Cultivating Humanity, A Classical Defense of Reform and Liberal Education, Sex and Social Justice, Women and Human Development, Upheavals of Thought, The Intelligence of Emotions, Frontiers of Justice, Disability, Nationality, Species Membership, the Clash Within, Democracy, Religious Violence, and India's Future. And she was just addressing the Normative Order Seminar in the Philosophy Department this afternoon on her 2008 book, Liberty of Conscience in Defense of America's Tradition of Religious Equality. And most recently, Political Emotions, Why Love Matters for Justice. Far more than a premier philosopher, she has also served her profession and international governmental agencies from 1986 to 1993, Nussbaum was a research advisor at the World Institute for Development Economics Research, Helsinki, a part of the United Nations University. She has chaired the American Philosophical Association's Committee on International Cooperation, the Committee on the Status of Women, and the Committee for Public Philosophy. And from 1999 to 2000, she was one of three presidents of the American Philosophical Association. And finally, she has been well recognized for her esteemed accomplishments. She has received honorary degrees from 50 colleges and universities in the US, Canada, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Among many awards, many very prestigious awards, Professor Nussbaum received the Graymeyer Award in Education in 2002, the Centennial Medal of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University in 2010. And in 2012, she was awarded the Prince of Asturias Prize in the Social Sciences. Before we begin, a final note, please silence all cell phones, iPads, other noise-making devices. Um, it really, you can hear them uh, loudly up here. At the end of the lecture, Professor Nussbaum will field her own questions. Um, she has uh, requested, we often ask this, but she has specifically requested that um, students ask uh, the first questions. Um, so if you're not a student, please let students, um, uh, there will be a microphone in the center aisle um, to uh, come forward uh, to pose questions. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nar Martha Nussbaum. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so that was overly generous, but it's really, really nice to be back here at Georgetown and to be lecturing for the first time in this very beautiful auditorium. So thank you. At the end of Aeschylus's Oresteia, two transformations take place in the archaic world of the characters. One is famous, the other often neglected. 
In the famous transformation, the goddess Athena introduces legal institutions to replace and terminate the seemingly endless cycle of blood vengeance. Setting up a court of law with established procedures of reasoned argument and the weighing of evidence, and a jury selected by, from the citizen body of Athens, she announces that blood guilt will from now on be settled by law rather than by the Furies, ancient goddesses of revenge. But, and this is part and parcel of her transformation of the Athenian community, the Furies are not simply dismissed. Instead, Athena persuades them to join the city, giving them a place of honor beneath the earth in recognition of their importance for these same legal institutions and the health of the city. Typically, this move of Athena's is understood to be a recognition that the legal system must incorporate the dark vindictive passions and honor them. The suggestion is that the resentful passions themselves remain unaltered. They simply have a new house built around them. They agree to accept the constraints of law, but they retain their own old nature, dark and vindictive. <clears throat> That reading, however, ignores the second transformation, a transformation in the nature and demeanor of the Furies themselves. At the outset of the drama, the Furies are described as repulsive and horrifying. They're said to be black, disgusting, their eyes drip a hideous blood. Apollo says they vomit up clots of blood that they've ingested from their prey. And he says they belong in some barbarian tyranny where it's customary to kill people arbitrarily, to mutilate and torture them. Nor when they awaken do the Furies give the lie to these grim descriptions. As Clytemnestra's ghost calls to them, they do not even speak, but simply moan and whine, noises characteristic of animals. Their only words when they first begin to speak are, get him, get him, get him, get him as close to a predator's hunting cry as the genre allows. As Clytemnestra says, in your dream you pursue your prey and you bark like a hunting dog, hot on the trail of blood. If the Furies are later given articulate speech as the genre demands, we are never to forget this initial characterization. What Aeschylus has done here is to depict unbridled resentment. It is obsessive, destructive, existing only to inflict pain and ill. As the great 18th century philosopher Bishop Butler observes much later, no other principle or passion hath for its end the misery of our fellow creatures. In its zeal for blood, it is subhuman. Apollo's idea is that this rabid breed belongs somewhere else, in some society that doesn't try to moderate cruelty, surely not in a society that claims to be civilized. Unchanged, these furies could not be part and parcel of a working legal system in a society committed to the rule of law. You don't put wild dogs in a cage and come out with justice. But the furies do not make the transition to democracy unchanged. Until quite late in the drama, they are still their doggy selves, threatening to disgorge their venom. Then, however, Athena persuades them to alter themselves so as to join her enterprise. Lull to repose the bitter force of your black wave of anger, she tells them. But of course, this means a very profound transformation, a transformation that's almost like a virtual change of identity. So bound up are they with anger's obsessive force. She offers them incentives to join the city, a place of honor beneath the earth, reverence from the citizens. But the condition of this honor is that they become fully human, not totally taken up with revenge, but able to adopt a new range of sentiments, and in particular, benevolent, forward-looking sentiments toward the city. They must also refrain from stirring up anger within it. The deal is that if they do good and they have and express kindly sentiments, they will receive good treatment and be honored. Perhaps most fundamentally transformative of all, they must listen to the voice of persuasion, all of this, needless to say, is not just external containment. It's a profound inner reorientation. They accept her offer and express themselves, quote, with gentle tempered intent, end quote. Each, they declare, should give generously to each in a mindset of common love, koinophile dianoia. 
Not surprisingly, they are transformed physically in analogous ways. They apparently assume an erect posture for the procession that concludes the drama, and they receive crimson robes from a group of citizen escorts. So they become women rather than beasts. Their very name is changed. They're now called the kindly ones, Eumenides, not the Furies. This second transformation is just as significant as the first one, indeed crucial to the success of the first one. Aeschylus shows that political justice does not just put a cage around resentment, it fundamentally transforms it from something hardly human, obsessive, bloodthirsty, to something human, accepting of reasons, calm, deliberate, and measured, something that protects life rather than threatening it. The indignation that inhabits just institutions is not an angry sentiment at all. It's measured, forward-looking judgment in defense of life. The Furies are still needed because this is an imperfect world and there will always be crimes to be dealt with, but they are not wanted or needed in their original shape and form. Indeed, they're not their old selves at all. They've become instruments of justice and welfare. The city is liberated from the scourge of vindictive anger, which produces civil strife and premature death. In place of anger, the city gets forward-looking justice. It's no accident that the major Greco-Roman philosophers from Socrates to Seneca were strong opponents of retributivism in the criminal law and defenders of a welfare-based deterrent conception of punishment. Another liberation goes unexplored but invites our imaginations. It is the liberation of the private realm. In the old world of the Furies, the family and love, familial and friendly, were burdened by the continual need to avenge something for someone. The need for retaliation was unending and it shadowed all relationships, including those fundamentally benign, such as Orestes' relationship with his sister Electra. Revenge made it impossible for anyone to love anyone. But now, law takes over the task of dealing with crime, leaving the family free to be a place of philia, of reciprocal goodwill. It's not that there are no more occasions for anger, but if they're serious, they're turned over to the law. And if they're not serious, why should they long trouble reciprocal concern? As Aristotle will later say, the gentle-tempered person his name for the virtue in the area of anger, is not vengeful, but instead inclined to sympathetic understanding. So law gives a double benefit, it keeps us safe without, and it permits us to care for one another, unburdened by retributive anger within. So that's my normative idea in a nutshell, and it's, it's a long book that this is a part of, but it's radical and evokes strong opposition for anger with all its ugliness, is a popular emotion. Many people think it's impossible to care for justice without anger at injustice, and that anger should be encouraged as part of the transformative process. Many also believe that it's impossible for individuals to stand up for their own self-respect without anger, and that someone who reacts to wrongs and insults without anger is spineless and downtrodden. Women, in particular, are often urged to tap into their own anger and to see this search for suppressed anger as part of a personal struggle for self-respect. Moreover, many people also believe that getting angry when someone else does something wrong is essential to taking that person seriously. If you wrong me and I don't get angry at you, I'm treating you condescendingly, like a child or a non-responsible person. Nor are these ideas confined to the sphere of personal relations, the most popular position in the sphere of criminal justice today, both theoretically and practically, is retributivism. That is the view that the law ought to punish aggressors in a manner that embodies the spirit of justified anger. And it's also very widely believed that successful challenges against great injustice need the spirit of anger to make progress. Anger is at the heart of revolutionary transformation. Still, we may take courage from the fact the recent years have seen three noble and successful freedom movements conducted in a spirit of non-anger, those of Mohandas Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela. 
surely people who stood up for their self-respect and that of others, and who did not acquiesce in injustice. Note that I said non-anger, not non-violence. Gandhi also espoused total non-violence. King granted that violence in self-defense was permissible, but urged non-violence for strategic reasons. Mandela, of course, turned from nonviolence to violence for a time for his own strategic reasons when nonviolence had failed, but he never wavered in his commitment to non-anger, and I'll come back to that later on. But I'll now argue that a close philosophical analysis of the emotion of anger can help us to support these philosophies of non-anger, showing why anger is fatally flawed from a normative viewpoint, sometimes incoherent, and sometimes based upon bad values. In either case, it's of dubious value in life and in the law. So I'll present my general view and then I'll show its relevance to thinking well about revolutionary justice. So let me begin with Aristotle's definition, which commands pretty wide agreement in the Western philosophical tradition, although it, as we'll see, it needs to be modified in some respects. So Aristotle says that anger is a response to a significant damage to something or someone that one cares about and a damage that the angry person believes to have been wrongfully inflicted. He adds that although anger is painful, it also contains within itself a pleasant hope for payback or retaliation. So significant damage pertaining to one's own values or circle of cares and wrongfulness now those two elements I think seem both true and pretty uncontroversial, and they have been validated by modern psychological studies of anger. More controversial perhaps is the idea that the angry person wants some type of payback, and that this is a conceptual part of what anger is. All the Western philosophers who talk about anger include this wish as a conceptual element in anger, at least all the ones that I'm aware of, Still, we need to pause since it's not obvious. Now we should understand that the wish for payback can be a very subtle wish. The angry person doesn't need to wish to take revenge herself. She may simply want the law to do so, or even some type of divine justice. Or even more subtly, she may simply want the wrongdoer's life to go very badly in future hoping that the second marriage of your betraying spouse turns out really badly, for example. I think if we understand the wish in this broad way, then Aristotle is right. Anger does contain a sort of strike back tendency, and that is what differentiates it from related emotions such as compassionate grieving. Contemporary psychologists who study anger empirically agree with Aristotle in seeing this double movement in it from pain to hope. An example will help. Suppose a wrongdoer has murdered Angela's child. She does, of course, feel enormous grief and loss. But suppose she's angry at the murderer, as of course she's very likely to be. What is that emotion all about? It isn't just sadness at the loss since its focus is on the wrongfulness of the act. But still, is it just sadness that a wrongful act has occurred and a wish that it had not occurred? If that's all she feels, then I think we would not call her emotion anger. It would be a special species of grief. But then, what is it that does make her emotion anger? I think it is the wish for some type of retribution, however subtle, and I'll come back to this. But one more thing that Aristotle says is not quite right. He says that anger is always a response not to any old damage, but to what he calls a slighting or a downranking, oligoria. Now this does not, I think, seem to be true all of the time. I can get angry at wrongs done to others without thinking of them as diminutions or downrankings of me. I can even get angry at violation of principles that I care about. But still, let's hold on to Aristotle's idea, for it does cover surprisingly many cases of anger as empirical researchers discover and emphasize. And it can help us to make sense of some puzzling things that we'll get to shortly. Now we're ready to see what's normatively problematic about anger. The central issue is this. The payback idea does not make sense. 
Ideas of cosmic balance are extremely widespread and archaic, and almost all of us have them at some level. When wrong is done, we somehow think that the universe will be off kilter unless there's a proportional rectification. The earliest preserved piece of Western philosophy, a fragment of the philosopher Anaximander in the sixth century BCE, says that human justice is like the cycle of the seasons, that the hot and cold, as he puts it, pay penalty to each other, each by predominating for a while and then being squeezed out in their turn. Unfortunately, not soon enough, at least not in Chicago. Um, but this is, then, something that people believe, whether because of their experience of the seasons or some other deep-rooted tendency. But it just doesn't make sense in the world of human action. Whatever the wrong was that was done, a murder, a rape, inflicting pain on the wrongdoer does not help restore the thing that was lost. As Aeschylus says, when a man's blood is spilt upon the ground, who can call it back again? We think about payback all the time, and it's deeply human to think that proportionality between punishment and offense somehow makes good or balances out the offense. Only it doesn't. So let's say that my friend has been raped. I urgently want the offender to be arrested, convicted, and punished. But really, what good will that do? Looking to the future, I may want many things, to restore my friend's life, to prevent and deter future rapes. But harsh treatment of this particular wrongdoer might or might not achieve the latter goal. It's an empirical matter, as Plato, rejecting Anaximander's archaic idea of punishment, already saw. And usually people do not treat it as an empirical matter. They're in the grip of an idea of cosmic fitness that makes them think blood for blood, pain for pain, is the way that we must go. The payback idea is deeply human, but fatally flawed as a way of making sense of the world. But now we can return to Aristotle's idea of downranking. For there is one, and I think only one, situation in which the payback idea does make perfect sense. This is when I see the wrong as entirely and only a down ranking, that is, as entirely about relative status. If the problem is not the murder or rape itself, but the way it has affected my relative rank in the social hierarchy, then I really can achieve something by humiliating the wrongdoer. By putting him relatively lower, I put myself relatively higher. And since status we're imagining is all I care about, I don't need to worry that the real well-being problems created by the wrongful act have not been addressed. In short, a wrong person who is really angry, seeking to strike back, soon arrives, I claim, at a fork in the road. Three paths are open to her. Either she goes down the path of status, the status focus, what I call the road of status, seeing the event as all about her and her relative rank, or second, she focuses on payback and imagines the offender's suffering would actually make things better, a thought that doesn't make sense, so I call that the road of payback. Or, if she is rational, after exploring and rejecting these two flawed paths, she will notice that a third path is open to her, which is the best of all. She can focus on doing whatever would make sense in the situation and be really helpful going forward. This may well include the punishment of the wrongdoer, but in a spirit that is forward-looking and deterrent or reformatory rather than retaliatory. Well, wait a minute. What's really wrong with a status path? Many societies, including ours a lot of the time, do encourage people to think of all injuries as essentially about them and their own relative ranking. Life involves perpetual status anxiety, and more or less everything that happens to one either raises one's rank or lowers it. Aristotle's society, as he depicts it, was to a large extent like this. And he was very critical of this tendency on the grounds that obsessive focus on honor impedes the pursuit of intrinsic goods. The error involved in the status path is not silly or easily dismissed. Still, the tendency to see everything that happens as about oneself and one's own relative rank seems very narcissistic and ill-suited to a society in which reciprocity and justice are important values. 
It loses the sense that actions have intrinsic moral worth, that the murder of Angela's child is bad because of the loss of the child and the suffering it inflicts on others, and not because of the way it humiliates the victim and her friends. Even in the case where one is oneself the victim of a crime, such as rape or assault, it somehow seems off to view rape as bad because it is a, a downranking in terms of relative status rather than because it inflicts pain and trauma. If it were primarily about relative status, it could be rectified by the humiliation of the offender. And many people certainly believe and try to do something like this. But isn't this thought a red herring, diverting us from the reality of the victim's pain and trauma, which need to be constructively addressed by attention to her? All sorts of bad acts, murder, assault, theft, rape, need to be addressed as the specific acts they are, and their victims or the victim's families need constructive attention. None of this will be likely to happen if one thinks of the offense as all about relative status rather than about human welfare. So to put my radical claim succinctly, when anger makes sense, it is, its retaliatory tendency is normatively problematic because focused on relative status. When it's normatively more reasonable, focused on the actual injury, its retaliatory tendency doesn't make sense, and it's normatively problematic in that way. An irrational person, anger, realizing that, soon laughs at itself and goes away. From now on, I'll call this healthy segue into forward-looking thoughts, and accordingly, from anger to compassionate hope, the transition, capital T. Okay, so that's a quasi-technical term. To clarify further what I mean by the transition, let me consider a case in which it takes a political form, thus introducing our topic of transitional justice. So let's look carefully at the sequence of emotions in Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. King begins, indeed, with an Aristotelian summons to anger. He points to the wrongful injuries of racism, which have failed to fulfill the nation's implicit promises of equality. 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, he says, quote, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination, end quote. The next move King makes is highly significant. For instead of going on to demonize white Americans or portraying their behavior in terms apt to elicit rage or desire for payback, he calmly compares them to people who have defaulted on a financial obligation. Quote, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Here begins the transition, for it makes us think ahead in non-retributive ways. The essential question is not how whites can be humiliated, but how can this debt be made good? And in the financial metaphor, the thought of humiliating the debtor is not likely to be central. The transition then gets underway in earnest, as King focuses on a future in which all may join together in pursuing justice and honoring obligations. Quote, but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation, end quote. No mention again of torment or payback, only of determination to ensure the protection of civil rights at last. King reminds his audience that the moment is urgent and that there is a danger of anger spilling over, but he repudiates this in advance. Quote, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force, end quote. So the payback is reconceived as the vindication of civil rights, a process that unites black and white in a quest for freedom and justice. Everyone benefits, as many white people already recognize, says King, quote, their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. King next repudiates a despair that could lead either to violence or to the abandonment of effort. It is at this point that the most famous section of the speech, the I Have a Dream, takes flight. 
And of course, this dream is not one of torment or retributive punishment, and it's not the book of Revelation, but of equality, liberty, and brotherhood. In pointed terms, King invites the African-American members of his audience to imagine, which would have been very difficult, I think, at the time, brotherhood even with their former tormentors. So this part I'll quote at length. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. Now there is indeed anger in King's speech at first, and the anger summons up a vision of rectification, which takes naturally, at first, a retributive form. But King gets busy right away, reshaping retributivism into work and hope. For how, sanely and really, could injustice be made good by retributive payback? The oppressor's pain and lowering do not make the afflicted free. Only an intelligent and imaginative effort toward justice could do that. So that's what I mean by the transition, a movement from anger with all of its defects to forward-looking constructive thought and work. King favored nonviolence, as I said. So have many intelligent leaders. Sometimes, however, that strategy fails. Nelson Mandela records the gradual decision of the ANC under his leadership that violent strategies would have to be pursued. But notice that while urging ANC members to wake up to anger's call, and even sense it as a motivating force. And while authorizing certain sorts of violent guerrilla tactics, he never failed to point to the transition, pointing people ahead toward a future of cooperation rather than of payback. Now it's here that I think we can introduce a major exception to my thesis that anger always involves conceptually a thought of retribution. There are of course many cases in which one gets standardly angry first thinking about some type of payback, and then in a cooler moment, heads for the transition. But there are at least a few cases in which one is there already. The entire content of one's emotion is, how outrageous, something must be done about that. Let's call this emotion transition anger. Since it is, it's anger or quasi-anger, but already heading down the third fork in Angela's road. Transition anger does not focus on relative status, nor does it even briefly want the suffering of the offender as a type of payback for the injury. It never gets involved at all in that type of magical thinking. It focuses on welfare from the start, saying something must be done about this, it commits itself to a search for strategies, but it remains an open question whether the suffering of the offender will be among the most appealing. This sort of borderline anger is often felt by parents toward their children. So the children do something that's really outrageous, and the parents are really outraged, but they're not angry in the usual sense because they don't even briefly want payback suffering for the child, they want only good to ensue for the child. So, so think about that, and you'll see what I mean by transition anger. What good can we say about ordinary garden variety anger? Anger has a very limited but real utility, which derives very likely from its evolutionary role as a fight or flight mechanism. It may play, I think, three roles. First, anger can be a useful signal, a kind of wake-up call that something's badly wrong. Still, the signal has a lot of noise given anger's connection to status, not the most reliable signal. Second, anger can sometimes also motivate people to address real problems. Again, it might not be the most reliable motivation. King said he used the highly formal 
and disciplined structure of the nonviolent protest march to channel real anger, which would be unpredictable, into something that would really prove governable and useful. Third, anger may be a deterrent. That is, people refrain from transgressing against people if they think that an angry outburst is likely. Well, this may be true, and probably on the road it's true a lot, but it's not a very good way to relate to people in society. That is, scaring them off from treating you badly by inspiring fear of an explosion. I know people like this, but they may simply achieve isolation and not friendly treatment. More generally, the way anger deters is not likely to lead to a future of stability or peace. Instead, it's all too likely to lead to more devious aggression. And there are many ways of deterring wrongdoing, some of which are much more attractive than inspiring fear of an explosion. In any case, we may retain these limited instrumental roles for anger while insisting that its payback fantasy is profoundly misleading and that to the extent that it does make sense, as it does in the case of relative status, it does so against the background of diseased values. The emotion in consequence is highly likely to lead us astray. The tendency to anger and retaliation is deeply rooted in human psychology. Anger brings some benefits that may even have been valuable at one stage in human prehistory. Even today, vestiges of its useful role remain. Beneficent forward-looking systems of justice, however, have largely made this emotion unnecessary, and we are free to attend to its irrationality and destructiveness. What's the upshot for law? In my larger project, I ask first about everyday justice and then about revolutionary justice. As far as everyday justice goes, the upshot is precisely what Jeremy Bentham and Plato before him thought, the constructive forward-looking thought about how to deal with the whole social problem of crime and wrongdoing is what should interest us, not the empty fantasy of payback. Punishment, if we end up using it, ought to compete for our attention with other strategies for dealing with crime, hopefully ex ante, and thus the debate about the so-called justification of punishment really ought to be about how punishment at all measures up to other strategies a society can use to prevent and cabin crime. As Bentham emphasized, preventing wrongful acts is a complicated task, and we need to consider it in the broadest possible way, asking how nutrition, social welfare, early childhood education, and a variety of constructive social policies may contribute. Bentham argued that the focus on punishment ex post is quite inefficient if what one really wants is less offending. Often, he said, the same result can be attained, quote, as effectually at a cheaper rate by instruction, for instance, as well as by terror, by informing the understanding, as well as by exercising an immediate influence on the will, end quote. At any rate, one must study the entire question, and that's what I, I feel in our society, certainly we too rarely do. It's as if parents stop thinking about education, nutrition, inspiration, and love to focus single-mindedly on harsh treatment of the bad behavior that would surely follow such neglect. Parents don't behave this way because they love their children and they think of their well-being as part of the parent's own. Unfortunately, citizens don't always love our fellow citizens, and they don't always think of their well-being as a part of their own. And that, I fear, is why many modern societies, and our own in particular, have been willing to tolerate a pile-on-the-misery strategy in punishment as if it really made sense, but that's something for another time, and I will not say more about that here. So let me now turn to the topic of transitional justice, or return to it, because with King, we're there already. Philosophers and non-philosophers alike have very often seen anger as appropriate in situations of oppression and as linked to the vindication of self-respect. It is then not surprising that non-anger in such situations should have struck many onlookers as strange, unmanly, even revolting. Consider the reaction of Webb Miller, the UPI correspondent who reported the nonviolent protest action conducted by Mohandas Gandhi at the Dharasana Salt Works in 1930. Miller observed scores of marchers, four by four, getting beaten down by the British police, 
all day long. They would go forward, the movie depicts this very beautifully. Four by four, they get clubbed down, dragged away, and so on. And he reacted with perplexity, as he records in a later memoir. He writes, not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like ten pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening wax of the clubs on unprotected skulls. At times, the spectacle of unresisting men being methodically bashed into a bloody pulp sickened me so much that I had to turn away. The Western mind finds it difficult to grasp the idea of non-resistance. I felt an indefinable sense of helpless rage and loathing, almost as much against the men who were submitting unresistingly to being beaten as against the police wielding the clubs. And this despite the fact that when I came to India, I sympathized with the Gandhi cause. Now the marchers were not simply acquiescing. Miller could surely see that. Their march was a demand and a protest. They continued to march and they kept chanting the slogan, long live the revolution. And yet, as Miller says, there is something in the mind and not only the Western mind, because the assassin of Gandhi in 1948, Natharam Godse, says his, he was motivated by the Gandhi's assault on aggressive manliness uh, that uh, resists accepting this way of reacting to brutal behavior. What do Gandhi and King have to say to people who think that anger is the right response to oppressive behavior and the only response consistent with real self-respect? First, they point out that the stance they recommend is anything but passive. Gandhi, who was not terribly fluent in English and who wrote in Gujarati, soon um, he at first allowed the words passive resistance as transi translations of his Gujarati words, but he soon re rejected those terms as misleading when he really understood the implication. And both he and King continually insist that what they recommend is a state of mind that is highly active, even in King's words, dynamically aggressive. In that, it involves resistance to unjust conditions and courageous protest against them. But when I say we should not resent, I do not say that we should acquiesce, says Gandhi. For King, similarly, quote, I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have said that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. Both men explicitly hold, as do I, that anger is inherently wedded to a payback mentality. Gandhi says resenting means wishing harm to the opponent, if only through divine agency. King similarly speaks of a strike back mentality. So that's what they want to get rid of, and we'll soon see what they want to replace it with. Moreover, this new attitude is not only internally active, it issues in concrete actions with one's body, actions that require considerable courage. King calls this direct action, action in which after what he calls self-purification, and that is the rejection of anger, one's own body is used to make the case. This action is a forceful and uncompromising demand for justice and freedom. The protester acts by marching, by breaking an unjust law, in a deliberate demand for justice by refusing to cooperate with an unjust authority. The goal, in King's case, to force negotiation and move toward legal and social change. For Gandhi, it is nothing less than to overthrow a wrongful government. The idea of acquiescence in brutality is presumably what revolted Webb Miller, but he just misunderstood. There's no acquiescence, there's a courageous struggle for a radical end. So what's the new attitude with which they propose to replace anger? King, interestingly, as I mentioned, allows some scope for real anger, holding that demonstrations and marches are a way of channeling repressed emotions that might otherwise lead to violence. Nonetheless, even when at first there is real anger, it must soon lead to a focus on the future with hope and with faith in the possibility of justice. Meanwhile, Anger toward opponents is to be transformed into a mental attitude that carefully separates the deed from the doer, criticizing and repudiating the bad deed, but not imputing unalterable evil to people. Deeds may be denounced. People always deserve respect and sympathy. 
After all, as King puts it, the ultimate goal is, quote, to create a world where men and women can live together. And that goal needs the participation of all. Above all, then, one should not wish to humiliate opponents in any way or wish the mill, but instead one should seek to win their friendship and cooperation. Gandhi remarks that early in his career, he already felt how inappropriate it was to sing the second stanza of God Save the Queen, which asks, asks God to scatter her enemies and make them fall, confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks. And Gandhi says, how can we assume these opponents are knavish? Surely the believer in non-anger should not encourage that kind of demonizing. The opponent is a person who has made a mistake, but we hope he can be won over by friendship and generosity. But since um, we've all been thinking a lot of Nelson Mandela since his death last year, and his ideas played a central role in my project even before his death, let me conclude with that example. And I think it also has the advantage that Mandela conscious of the fact that he lived in a religiously plural society, did not rely on any kind of religious metaphysics for the justification of his ideas. So I've argued that anger leads down two paths, either of which has an unattractive error built into it. Either anger's wish for ill to befall the wrongdoer is pointless since payback does no good for the important elements of human flourishing that have been damaged or it remains focused on relative status, in which case it may possibly succeed in its aim, relative abasement, but the aim itself is singularly unworthy. I'll now argue that Mandela instinctively comes to the same conclusion, in a way informed by his study of Gandhi, but shaped much more by his own life experience and his long period of self-examination during his 27 years as a prisoner a time that he says was extremely productive in meditating about anger. And I should add, we also know now, recently it's been uh, proven, that Ahmad Kathrada, the fellow prisoner, had brought in a manuscript of Marcus Aurelius's meditations so that the prisoners in Robben Island really were studying Stoic philosophy. I mean, it was already clear that Mandela later alludes to Marcus Aurelius, but now we know that during those long years of daily meditation, he, he followed that lead. So what did Mandela realize in those long hours of what he calls Conversations with Myself, the title of a book of interviews and letters in which he deliberately compares his experience to the meditations of Marcus Aurelius? First, he recognized, he says, that obsession with status is ubiquitous but unworthy and thus refuses to go down that road, although he uses his understanding of that human error to relate to others. As for the wish for payback, he understands it very well and feels it in his own life. But he recognized, he tells us, that payback simply doesn't get you anywhere. Maybe at some level you have a choice between anger and non-anger in the sense that wrongdoing might understandably and humanly ground either reaction. But if we ponder the sheer futility of the payback wish, and if we actually want good for ourselves and for others, we quickly discover that non-anger and a generous disposition are far more useful. Above all, says Mandela, they're far more useful for a person who is the fiduciary of a nation. To put it in a nutshell, a responsible leader has to be a pragmatist, and anger is incompatible with forward-looking pragmatism. It just gets in the way. A good leader must move to the transition as rapidly as possible, and perhaps for most of his life just stay there. A good summary of Mandela's approach can be found in a little parable he told to his interviewer, Richard Stengel, and he says it's one he often used with his followers. I told the incident of an argument between the sun and the wind, that the sun said, I'm stronger than you are, and the wind says, no, I'm stronger than you are. And they decided, therefore, to test their strength with a traveler who was wearing a blanket. And they agreed that the one who would succeed in getting the traveler to take off the blanket would be the stronger. So the wind started. It started blowing, and the harder it blew, the tighter the traveler pulled the blanket about his body. And the wind blew and blew, but it could not get him to discard the blanket. And as I said, the harder the wind blew, the tighter the visitor tried to hold the blanket around his body. And the wind eventually gave up. Then the sun started with its rays. 
very mild, and they increased in strength. And as they increased, the traveler felt that the blanket was unnecessary because the blanket is for warmth. And so he decided to relax it, to loosen it, but the rays of the sun grew stronger, and eventually he threw it away. So, by a gentle method, it was possible to get the traveler to discard the blanket. And this is the parable, that through peace you will be able to convert, you see, the most determined people. And this is the method that we should follow. Significantly, Mandela frames the whole inquiry in forward-looking pragmatic terms as a question of getting the other party to do what is useful. He then shows that this task is much more feasible if you can get the other party to work with you rather than against you. Progress is impeded by the other party's defensiveness and anxious self-protection. Anger, consequently, does nothing to move matters forward. It just increases the other party's anxiety. A gentle approach, by contrast, can gradually weaken defenses until the whole idea of self-protection is given up. Mandela, of course, was neither naive nor so ideological as to refuse reality. Thus, I think we would never have found him proposing, as did Gandhi, to drop armed resistance to Hitler or to try converting Hitler by charm. His parable is offered in a particular context, that of the ending of a sometimes violent liberation struggle with people on the other side, many of whom are genuine patriots, wishing the future good of the nation. He insisted from the start of his career that nonviolence was a strategic choice. Still, behind the strategic resort to violence even, was always a view of people that was transitional, focused not on payback, but on the creation of a shared future in the wake of outrageous and terrible deeds. Two famous examples show Mandela checking the demands of the ANC for payback in the service of the future to be created. The first is the example of rugby, known now through the excellent film Invictus, based on John Carlin's book, which is even a lot better because it's got a lot more detail. The ANC had voted to decertify the national rugby team as an official team of the nation in an attempt to punish the racist rugby community, since it had been an almost exclusively white sport and an Afrikaner sport, and people were really racist. Mandela understood the strategic importance of sport for reconciliation, and he set out to form a friendship with the team's captain and the other players, in the process also getting them to offer rugby clinics in the townships and thus making it far less of an all-white sport. The celebration of the World Cup victory was the culmination of this long strategic campaign, and when the huge crowd assembled in the stadium chanted in unison Mandela's name, the future of the nation was one big step further on. The second related example is that of the national anthem. So the ANC had voted to substitute the freedom anthem in Cozy Sikalele Africa for the old national anthem, the Afrikaans language anthem, Die Stem. Mandela saw that this would impede a future of reconciliation. I mean, he understood that music, like sport, touches people at a very deep level. So he proposed and convinced his party to accept the version that is now sung, in which the two anthems are put together, with Nkosi being sung in three different African languages, and then we have the part in Afrikaans that comes from Distem, and then there's a final stanza in English. In both of these cases, payback was very natural, and it looked right. Mandela preferred a more difficult, and I think ultimately more productive course. Although the ANC surely thought that their self-respect required payback, they later granted that a generous spirit was both self-respecting and far more useful for the nation. So let me just end this lecture with one more Mandela story, which shows him renouncing at one and the same time both the status error and the payback error. So Mandela here is talking about an interaction with a white Afrikaner jailer, they call them warders, who watched him when he was in the transitional prison, Victor Vorster, 
prior to his official release. So he was in three prisons, Robben Island, where the conditions were really very, very bad, and he was there for many, many years. Then there was briefly Palsmore Prison, which was a little bit less bad. But then finally, just after they already knew that he was going to be the leader of the new nation, but just prior to his official release, he was in this very nice kind of country club-like prison where he had a personal cook and really nice conditions, and this Afrikaner warder was his personal cook and servant. Okay, so the question now is how the dishes are gonna get done, a question in many households all over the world. So Mandela says, I took it upon myself to break the tension and a possible resentment on, on his part that he has to serve a prisoner by cooking and then washing the dishes. And I offered to wash the dishes, and he refused. He says, this is his work. I said, no, we must share it. Although he insisted, and he was genuine, but I forced him, literally forced him, to allow me to do the dishes. And we established a very good relationship. A really nice chap, Warder Sfart, a very good friend of mine. It would have been so easy to see the situation as one of status inversion. The dominating Afrikaner is doing dishes for the once despised ANC leader. It would also have been so easy to see it in terms of payback. The warder is getting a punishment because of his complicity in racial oppression. Significantly, Mandela doesn't go down either of these doomed paths even briefly. He asks only, how shall I produce cooperation and friendship? It was this remarkable capacity for generosity and reciprocity that was Mandela's genius, the fruit, as he emphasizes, of years of critical self-examination on Robben Island. It's a difficult goal, but it's that goal that I'm recommending for both individuals and institutions. Anger is a prominent part of most people's life. I've argued that it lacks the virtues often claimed for it, and has both normative and practical problems all its own. I hesitate to conclude with a slogan that surely betrays my age, but maybe it does seem to be time to give peace a chance. Again, the first two questions have to come from students. I'm going to try to, if I can slide this out, then I can actually walk around. Ah, this is good, yeah. But I can't see people because it's kind of dark down there from my point of view, so maybe somebody else should do, you, you, you want to call on people? You could also just queue up at the mic. That, that would be the easiest way. But students first, at least two students. And say, say who you are and what school you're from. Hi, Program. my name's Vaughn Meyer. Thank you for coming oh, to speak to us. And I'm a graduate student in the School of Foreign Service. And I was wondering how you saw the role of forgiveness coming into play in uh, revolutionary justice, um, especially on, on for both sides, both those who have been oppressed and those who are the oppressors, both for the other group and for the self, and if forgiveness first requires anger. Uh, yeah, this is really of course, very, very important to me. My book is actually called Anger and Forgiveness. Now, there seem to be two basic positions about f forgiveness that you find in the philosophical literature and maybe religious as well. One is that um, forgiveness is mealy-mouthed. It's a sort of weak-hearted capitulation. That's Jeffrey Murphy's view. Um, it's, it's just, uh, if you're really self-respecting, you shouldn't uh, be willing to forgive people who've done the wrong thing. The other position is that we should uh, forgive, but then the question is what is meant by that. Now, the dominant definition of forgiveness deriving from long traditions in both Judaism and Christianity is that forgiveness is the waving of antecedent angry feelings in response to something that the wrongdoer does, some sort of apology. Charles Griswold, whose book I think is the best uh, book on forgiveness, says, well, the wrongdoer has to come and has to say, I'm, I, I'm sorry, and has to convince you 
that he's really changed and is not disposed to do it again and so on. And all of these things are in Maimonides and uh, Yonah of Gerona, the two canonical Jewish texts on forgiveness, and they're in a lot of the Christian tradition as well. So another, I'll call that, I'm sorry, this is gonna be long because it, it is complicated. It, I call that transactional forgiveness. And as you'll notice, it's modeled on, in its central cases, the relationship of the penitent to God. But it's sort of backformed into human relations. I'm quite critical of that because it says, I will behave like a generous spirited person only if you first perform some act of abasement before me. And it can often be quite unpleasant. You have, I mean, it goes on, confess and express contrition and so on and so on. So it's like you extract this often quite humiliating performance as the condition of your behaving uh, decently to this person in future. Um, so anyhow, it was a much longer topic than this, but I, I'm rather critical of that sort of forgiveness. Then the second thing we have, which we find in some Jewish texts, but certainly very prominently in some of the, I mean, the Gospels are quite a mixture on this, interestingly, uh, is what I'll call unconditional forgiveness, where there are antecedent angry feelings, but the person decides to waive them without this performance on the part of the other person. And of course, there's a large psychological literature about that, because often the wrongdoer is gone away and is certainly not gonna come and talk to you, but you still have these angry feelings you gotta deal with. Now, I think that one is a lot better because it's not extracting something from somebody as a condition of your uh, getting rid of what I think are wrong um, feelings to have anyway. But it does have a slight unpleasantness about it because you're pretending to a kind of moral superiority. You know, I have a right to these angry feelings, but I'll, and I could exact some kind of payback, but I'll waive them uh, just because whatever my psychologist tells, tells me to or because I will feel better or whatever. Um, so I think it's a little bit better, but not completely satisfactory. What I'm in favor of is the emotions that I think are best uh, depicted in the parable of the prodigal son, where the father sees the erring son coming a long way off, and he feels this great strong upsurge of emotions. The Greek is esplanknizthe, his guts were ripped out. A uh, very strong surge of, of love, and he goes and embraces him without even finding out whether the son is contrite or not. And actually, we don't know in the story he, um, because he comes back because he's starving. We don't know how contrite he is. Then the son does apologize after that. And the father sort of pays little attention to that. And he says, I'm so happy my son is, is found. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you're not going to give the son advice or you're not going to try to make his future better. But it means that you, the, it, there's unconditional love. And I think that is in the Gospels. It's not the only thing that's there, but it is very much a part of the Christian tradition and I would argue of the Jewish tradition as well. Um, so, so anyway, we have those three possibilities. Now, I think in terms of South Africa, the funny thing is that Desmond Tutu exemplifies forgiveness and I think really the first sort, transactional, in, in his appendix to No Future Without Forgiveness, which is just a straightforward description of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which did not require apologies, did not require any abasement, just required telling the truth, which is a different thing. Uh, he then casts the whole thing into a Christian framework where there must be confession contrition, promising not to do it again, and so on. So he puts it in that framework, but actually Mandela never does. And I've not only read everything that I'm aware that Mandela ever published, but I am, I've talked extensively with Alvy Sachs, who knew him very well, who one of the first judges of the South African Constitutional Court. He said the whole idea of forgiveness was completely alien. Our focus was on producing just institutions. And as for Mandela, you can see what he was after was generosity and friendship. Uh, now, of course, that doesn't mean wrongdoing doesn't have to be dealt with for the sake of establishing bonds of trust in the future nation. And so we have to have some uh, ferreting out of truth. In other instances, we will probably want criminal trials. There were specific reasons why they didn't want criminal trials. But anyway, <coughs> that's the way I would urge us to go, is in the direction of what can produce friendship and reconciliation, and that rarely involves this adversarial process of the, the penitent and the powerful, all, the person who arrogates 
to him or herself the role of, of God, in effect, you know, to look down on you and say, I forgive you. So that's too long an answer, but it's a very important part of the book. Hi, um, my name is Katie Highland. I'm a freshman in the college, and I was wondering what your thoughts might be on the way that justice and courts are portrayed in the media, namely shows like Law and Order, especially in regards to cases of mental illness, where one might plead not guilty by reason of mental illness, and um, namely the good guys of the show will kind of see that as a real injustice to the victim in a way, and like I wonder what your thought, do you think like shows might have a responsibility to change how they portray that kind of situation? Well, I think, you know, ever since storytelling began, stories have been accomplices of retributivism. Uh, you know, it's not just TV, but it's detective stories. And I mean, I devour, my favorite light reading is detective stories, which really whet your appetite for payback, some sort of payback, not always the, but, but the better detective stories also show the hollowness of that idea. I think Michael Connolly, for example, who's my favorite detective writer, shows you that the world is actually more complex than that. So I think the good TV shows are also like that. That is, they're about protecting people going forward and they're not about the easy gratification of uh, bloodlust that people feel all too easily. Uh, I myself am a devoted watcher of Law and Order SVU. And uh, I'm afraid that there is empirical evidence that if, you're, if you love law and order shows, they, you shouldn't be seated on a jury because you're gonna be harsh to the defendant. But I actually think that show is not like that because it, it, it's very critical of the wonderful actor Chris Maloney playing Elliot Stabler because he is an angry man and he's a, he's a wild man and he isn't for justice and he isn't really for defending the victims. And it's about the pain that Mariska Hargitay you know, internalizes in her search to protect victims going forward. So I think it's about deterrence much more than retributivism, but I realize that not everyone sees it in the same way. Um, I guess I think that it would be good if TV complicated our sense of what does good and what makes sense and did not uh, whet the already keen appetite for more and more incarceration, which is really doing our society great harm. So, but I think that some of the better shows do, but unfortunately, you know, the shows that succeed are the ones that correspond to the antecedent mindset of the American people, which is not good. I mean, even our really quite reasonable Senator Mark Kirk said that he thought it'd be a good idea if all the members of the gangs in Chicago, which are some, you know, many thousands of young men, would, both Latino and African American young men, would be incarcerated ex ante, you know, just that that would be the best thing, to pay them back even before they do something. So this keen desire for payback is really a terrible social problem, I think, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm not a student, is it okay? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. So we'll okay. make sure we get to them. Okay, I'm Richard Wagaman from the Department of Psychiatry. Thank you so much. I have a quick joke and a comment, but what you said about the prodigal son made me think of uh, the enigma of Prospero forgiving his evil, unrepentant brother yeah. at the end of The Tempest. So that is That's a really right. interesting That is really. No, I mean, um, Shakespeare would be wonderful to talk about in this connection. Yes, yes but absolutely. Let me go on to the joke, because it's about, <laughs> it's a joke about transitional anger. A Quaker wakes up in the middle of the night, uh, hears a noise downstairs, goes downstairs and confronts a burglar, and says to the burglar, brother, I would not harm thee for the world, but thou standest where I'm about to shoot. <laughs> mm. But let me move on to my serious comment. Uh, well, you know, I mean, of course, self-defense is much discussed. Even Gandhi, I have, to, I have to say, I said that King was in favor of, well, self-defense, violence and self-defense. Gandhi did not favor violence and self-defense from one human to another human, but he thought when the, the uh, marauding, um, rabid uh, monkey came into a community, you could shoot that monkey. And that was a big concession that he made. And so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> even the most nonviolent person is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to very quickly say something about identification with the aggressor as a really important uh, coping mechanism in individuals, groups, uh, societies, nations. 
And one way I think about it and, and talk with some of my patients about it is that sometimes victims have a blind spot for their own victimizing behavior. So one example from the news, back during the Iraq War, as there was a proposal to withdraw our forces, there was a very poignant complaint from a mother who said her son uh, was a soldier who died in Iraq. And if we withdrew from Iraq, that would mean her son had died in vain. So an example from a group or actually a nation during the Second Intifada, as you probably remember, an IDF officer admitted that the Israeli Defense Forces were studying the tactics the Nazis had used in Warsaw to put down the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in order to use the same tactics against the Palestinians. Well, you know, it's just so easy for people to think in those terms, and we have to criticize it each time because it always takes some initially speciously plausible form, as, as in your first uh, example. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the tendency to think that pain can only be made good by some other similar pain inflicted on someone else is exactly what Aeschylus was trying to get us out of. But it comes up, you know, even in the most gentle and sophisticated philosophical theorists of punishment, such as, I, I would call Herbert Morris a gentle theorist. I wouldn't call Michael Moore a gentle theorist, but anyway, it's very sophisticated theorists of punishment hold this view that there's a proportionality between the pain that's been suffered and some pain that's inflicted is the only thing that kind of makes good the offense, and I just don't buy it. I mean, now, of course, those two people require much more extensive critique, but it is, I think, possible to do that. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Jeremy Olson. I'm a graduate student in physiology here. Um, really nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. This is fun. Um, my question is about um, an, like the the idea that um, a response of non-anger um, can be chosen when the outcome is not in flux, or, or I guess um, the to what degree does um, choosing the third path of non-anger, um, what would it mean to choose that when annihilation or um, a positive outcome is, is not possible? Well, remember that I'm not a pacifist, and I don't think we should always eschew violence. Uh, I do think that Mandela has the right take on this. That is, one should do it only in really desperate circumstances where we've tried the other first, and then do it in a limited way that is not piloted by the spirit of anger and retribution, but rather by a forward-looking strategy. So he always thought of the violence as aimed at a, a future. And I think, uh, you know, one could have a, a just war doctrine that had that same thought, although it doesn't, it doesn't always have that. Uh, so, so I think, you know, we don't have to sit around while desperate things are going on. And I think Gandhi really did get into d deep um, error when he said we shouldn't have any armed resistance to Hitler, and if Hitler was no worse than the British Raj, both were tyrannies, and so No, I mean, that was really awful. And uh, Nehru was quite right. I mean, see, Gandhi didn't know what the Nazis were. Nehru, because his wife had tuberculosis and he had been to Europe in sanitaria, uh, had seen the Nazis up close. And he said, no, you know, we have to join the armed resistance, and I think that was right to resist. Uh, uh, but So I hope that would uh, partly go a long way to answering your question. I'm not saying we should never have war, and I'm not saying we should never use violence. I'm just saying that the spirit behind it had better not be the spirit of anger. And I actually think, I would have to ask Nancy more about this, but that the military, by and large, would support that. I mean, Seneca's work on anger says to his brother, who's a Roman military person, what do you want, a bunch of people running amok with anger? No, you don't want that because that's going to create uh, excess. And uh, so, so I think if we want a, a, an army that can achieve what in a just cause you want to achieve, you better not have an army that's fed demonizing images of the enemy. And they're, they're much too likely to go to excess. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I am a freshman here, and my name is Catherine Sinkis. I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service here. Um, and throughout my education, um, 
I've, I've looked at many you know, movements um, against injustice, many of which have failed, and one of some kind of like a link between them seems to me to be a lack of a leader such as Gandhi or Mandela. And I'm wondering um, if you think that revolutionary justice success is contingent upon having a leader with this conception of anger that you have that can you know, convince the people against their natural impulse of payback. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the toughest questions for me because these three examples all do involve that. Now, I guess what one can also say though is that by now we have a long historical track record and examples to learn from so that now there can be, as there were in the wake of the things in both New York and Ferguson, um, nonviolent, disciplined protests led by non-charismatic people, such as the, the daughter of the man who died in New York. And so we know how to do it now. now maybe in the first instance it did require that kind of creativity, and probably without Gandhi, King uh, would have had a hard time even inventing it all on his own. I, I don't know what he would have come up with. He would have come up with something great, but maybe not the thing exactly that he had. But now we all know what it looks like, and I think it's great to study it in films. I mean, uh, films like uh, Selma, films like Gandhi, but also particularly the excellent Mandela film, which I think, well, both the Invictus and the more recent one with Idris Elba, because they make very vivid the importance of the generous spirit going forward. And, the, um, and then they give us models, role models that we can all follow. I also think the women's movement is a good thing to think about. I mean, there hasn't been really a charismatic leader of the women's movement worldwide or even in the US. I mean, Catherine McKinnon is a charismatic speaker when she speaks to an audience of a couple hundred people, but there's nothing like the mass movement leadership that, that people um, found in, in Gandhi, King, and Mandela. And yet, as a nonviolent protest movement, it's done pretty well, more to do. But you know, it's interesting that women found a way of having a nonviolent protest movement without even getting sandbagged by the tendency to make it into a violent movement. So I think it can be done. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Matt. I'm a uh, graduate student in the philosophy department. Um, so I wanted to maybe raise a couple of worries in response to your take on the idea of uh, revolutionary justice. Um, so I guess I, I worry about um, those of us who sort of enjoy extraordinary privilege, legislating and prescribing to people who face serious and rampant injustices and oppression, what their response to that oppression ought to be. In particular, um, I have a lot of trouble seeing even concretely or pragmatically what sort of form that would take. So if we were talking about, for example, the protest that you were just referencing, if I were to go up to an individual who struck me as angry and say that, well, you just sort of need to calm down and take a step back and engage in forward constructive thinking, that strikes me as a deeply misguided response to the, to the circumstances. It also seems to be tied to a really problematic history of people in hegemonic dominant positions of political power um, uh, dismissing the concerns of individuals who are politically oppressed and marginalized precisely with reference to their anger. So we have stereotypical images of the angry black man or the angry feminist. Um, so there's a long history there of um, casting anger as something that's normatively problematic so that we don't have to be answerable to those political demands. And I guess the, the second uh, worry that's connected to that is it seems as though you're putting uh, a lot of the onus on the victim here as opposed to the targets of what may be legitimate political anger. So you raised um, uh, an example before, or, or during, uh, during your talk, you were talking about how targets of that anger uh, will find, you know, they'll be anxious, um, uncomfortable, defensive, and so on. But it seems like if we're gonna be in the business of uh, prescribing appropriate normative attitudes, we should be critical of people being bad listeners to anger rather than those who might be legitimately reacting to circumstances of oppression and so on. So I yeah, I, you know, I, well. I see I see the point, and I think it's a very good question. I guess I think it's, first of all, very important to distinguish two separate things. What normatively can we justify as the right response, and under what circumstances would it be appropriate 
to approach somebody and tell them what to do. I mean, I think it's almost never appropriate to go up to some stranger and tell them what they should be doing uh, about anything. I mean, Americans all the time will come up to you and, oh, your skirt is uneven or you're holding your baby the wrong way and so on. But, you know, I think it's just nosy behavior and it's almost never appropriate about anything. Uh, so what I do is write a book, you know, and somebody can <laughs> take it up, read it, and think whether that makes sense for them. Uh, now, uh, so that's the first thing I'll say. Now, the, the second thing is never are we saying that this response you know, is something that belittles you or is not justified in some way. I mean, I introduce later in the manuscript a term called well-grounded, meaning it's, it's very, it's got good grounds, it's just that the payback part we want to try to say is not so valuable. And in other words, everything else about it, it was a real wrongful injury, very important injury and so on, we're insisting on. And that's what all these three people did. And by the way, uh, you know, Gandhi was not a person of privilege. He was a, a, a Banya a caste and not a upper caste at all, really. And uh, Mandela was a king. And the, so, so anyhow, they were different uh, people in terms of their social position. And they, it was a good thing that they did what they did, I think. And they didn't waste too much time asking themselves my question, like, under what circumstances are you entitled to approach someone? They just did it, and I'm glad they did, but uh, there is a, uh, I think th there is an ethical problem there. So, um, so we're not telling them that their anger is unseemly, and I guess we, we're just saying that the payback part of it is not very valuable, and it doesn't really make sense, and you're not gonna get what you think you're gonna get by that. But do we really err in that direction? I think myself that it's the non-angry person who's much more likely to be belittled, demonized, and stereotyped, particularly the non-angry male. Uh, I mean, I've just edited a volume on masculinity in American law and literature. And what's so fascinating, we had a conference on this, uh, but is to see how the dominant image is the man who just doesn't think first, just rides out on the frontier and whaps somebody. Even um, Gary Cooper in High Noon is already a little bit subversive because he thinks first, but of course, he can't really go along with his Quaker wife. He has to come back and whap the guy in the end. But in the conference, um, what we found is that no one wanted to talk about that anymore. They wanted to talk about different subversive kinds of masculinity, whether it was queer masculinity or Jewish masculinity, because they wanted to talk about the ways in which men have been able to find a space not to be that way. Uh, one fine paper about Atticus Finch, but that's an obvious case. So, so, so there are many other cases. Um, I think, though, even women are uh, at risk uh, of being perceived as, oh, too soft, you know, if they're, if they're not um, angry. I, I, I came to this topic thinking that I was pathological because I really do have a problem with anger and I don't think it's a good thing. I mean, I feel this very deeply in my own life, but I had become convinced that that was wrong and so on the capabilities list, you'll find justified anger uh, on the list. I was persuaded by other feminists that, that it was necessary to respond to oppression. And up until two years ago, and you will even find that I wrote an op-ed in the Indian Express about the um, right reaction to the trials of the people who murdered Muslims in India, I had a different view. And I, I did have the view that anger was right, but I've become convinced that it's wrong, and I'm you know, bound to be pilloried and demonized uh, for this because um, I was all my life. I mean, I was called these names by other children, like Artha Marguer is what I used to be called, meaning I'm the, the Martha who argues rather than getting angry. And you know, that's not a good thing in the kid world. So, um, so anyway, I don't know, uh, but certainly with men, I think the shoe is very much on the other foot. Hi, I'm not used to talking in these. Um, my name's Madison, I'm a junior in the biology department in the college. And um, I was reading an article today about Stephen Hawking and he was asked um, what's one human flaw that he would like to correct. And he said human aggression. Mm. And that it may have had some kind of survival um, advantage um, in the caveman days, but now it um, has the power to destroy us, especially with the 
development of nuclear weapons, and he said he would like to magnify empathy um, in hopes of bringing more peace and togetherness. And I just wanted to know your thoughts on aggression and anger and then empathy. Well, aggression, I mean, how it's related conceptually to anger is complicated because <coughs> aggression is never defined very precisely. If it means a kind of instinct for strong, assertive action, well, I, Fine with that. I mean, what King calls direct action is aggressive. And he even says dynamically aggressive, meaning goes out there mm -hmm. and does something very definite. Uh, but it isn't inspired by the wish for payback. So aggression, I think, is a complicated term. And I think probably what Hawking uh, is really focusing on is retribution. And that's, uh, I'm very glad to know that. I think that's great. Now, I see that Michael <laughs> wants us to end. So I think the next question, unfortunately, is going to have to be, now, if we had each one a very short version of their question, why don't you just all ask very short versions of your questions since you've been standing there so long, and I'll just try to say something very brief. Yeah, all at once, I think. Cool. Okay, so I'll go really quickly. Um, I was just thinking about the role of tactics that are rooted in some sort of anger and even the desire for payback, such as embarrassment, so different political movements that use embarrassment. We talked about a lot about violence, but I think that's a, a really interesting one yeah, yeah, yeah. to think about, because I think it okay. does have elements yeah, of anger. I'll try to anger. remember these, okay. Yeah. I just had a question concerning the transition process. It seems to me that in the three paths that you put forward, the first two would unconsciously uh, transition from a base point of anger as a sort of indicator of wrongdoing to some other emotion that would inform whatever action of retribution or revenge, whereas the third one be a conscious one. I just wanted a little bit more information about the transition process. Well, wait, let me answer those two, because I'm not going to be able to remember everything. Um, yeah, I think the desire to embarrass somebody is very slippery and very easy to slide into this relative status mentality. I think there are cases where, and, and uh, I've written about shame, the revival of punishments based on shaming in, in that vein. I think there are some cases where public embarrassment could be useful going forward, and it might be the most useful thing you can do, let's say for a law firm that's engaging in racial discrimination, for us to publicize that and say we're not gonna send our students to that firm, that could be very useful. Uh, so I don't rule it out, but I think it's very slippery. And uh, so wait, now, now yours was focused on what? Develop, oh, hmm? oh, oh, the, the two, the transition, yeah. Now I guess with the tr what my little borderline species of transition anger, you're already there. You don't have to make a transition because your thought is entirely how outrageous that is, that must not happen again. Now, if you're already there, just you just pursue it. If you're thinking one of the other two thoughts, then you have to turn somehow. But I don't think it always has to be a conscious process. I think it might be you just join a group that has that ideology and you get caught up in it. I think in the case of Mandela, it was often the sheer joy and fun of this man that brought people along. I mean, he, he, his gift was that he, and Gandhi had this too, he had great fun to be with, people just warm to his presence. And so it was that more than any conscious deliberative process, I think. Thank you. You started to answer my question a little bit. I was wondering in your case studies what you think you found that allowed these leaders to get the message across. So I'm thinking of the Haitian Revolution where the leadership was very non-angry and had this very enlightened forward-thinking approach, but couldn't get the message across, and it ended up ending in this spectacular anger with the massacre of the white population. Okay, so one last one. Hi, good evening. My question is about trials. So you're already in a transition process, the government is out, you have a new, a new line of thought. Um, even if you're trying to go forward and to build and to create equality, I mean, some things just somehow cannot be ignored. You have human rights violations, you name it. So how far can you go in imputing former oppressors into trials if you want to be constructive? Okay, good. Those are great questions to end with. So the first one, what allowed them to get their message across? It was not easy. In the case of Mandela, as you see, his own party repeatedly wanted to do things that he thought were wrong. It was his, there was, he was the child of a royal family. He had this huge height, 
he just had this regal bearing and this charm. And I think it's really that, that people just loved him and they gave him great um, deference and maybe more than they should, I don't know. But I mean, because he made some very wrong decisions like who should be the education minister and so forth. Um, in the case of Gandhi, similarly, he was personally enormously charismatic. And he got his message out whenever he was physically present. But during the rioting surrounding partition, when he wasn't there, it would fall apart. So he would have to go around and try to be in every place where there was rioting and killing. And it, it proved impossible in the end. And he stopped the violence in West Bengal, but not elsewhere. Um, yeah, so, but he had great, great charm. And he also used religious imagery in a very powerful way. Now, some people question that because, of course, it's a religiously plural country, and he fashioned his body and his whole appeal as that of the Hindu ascetic. But he countered that and supported pluralism by very strategically including Muslims in positions of leadership at even key religiously ritual moments, like who would give him food, for example. So I think he did pretty well and rallied all the symbols in a good way. And he was personally incredibly charismatic. Nehru himself, of, you know, a Kashmiri Brahmin lawyer, I mean, he was just totally bowled over by this little Banya trader. Uh, so it's extraordinary when you think about that. In the case of King, too, I mean, well, King was more, he was in a, a tradition, too, the tradition of the Christian preacher, and he used that tradition, as Gandhi used his religious tradition, to rally people, and he used religious language in a very rich way, but again, trying to make sure that everyone knows it's not just about Christians, it's about all people. Um, so anyway, they, they did it in those ways. Now, I think there are ways of having such a movement, like a decentralized women's movement, without a charismatic individual getting the message across, but it has to be much more through this consciousness raising group and that consciousness raising group and this legal NGO and so on. Uh, so it's much easier when you have someone who just has that rare ability to speak so persuasively with such, you know, an authority also born of suffering that no one can resist. So, wait, no, no, I, I get so caught up in the one question. So what's the, that's it, that's, that, that was the last. That, okay, so that is the last. They, didn't, they only had that one part. Okay. Thank you, Professor Hussman.